my audio is <laughs> passing. Yours is well, uh, everyone, we're yeah. live, and we're with Mr. Chris Taylor and Mr. Darren White here. <laughs> passing. Yours is well, uh, everyone, we're yeah. live, and we're with Mr. Chris Taylor. And you guys want to tell each other, uh, everyone about yourselves? We can start with you, Chris. Uh, sure. My name is Chris Taylor. Uh, I've been using uh, Automate for nine years. Um, I guess I've been in the role of LabTech admin for uh, four years. Uh, kind of always used ConnectWise, moved from Kaseya uh, to LabTech. Um, and I really mainly do lab tech. I guess I only do a little bit of ConnectWise. I try to stay out of ConnectWise about as much as I can because uh, I just don't want more jobs, I guess. But I guess that's kind of my start with uh, lab tech automate. Uh, you want any more info, I guess, on that? No, I think that's good. Um, I, I, I assume my audio is now working uh, at least going out now from what my levels show at least uh, so uh, Darren uh, right so <laughs> I'm uh, Darren White I've been uh, Ray Morgan for seven years been uh, uh, doing IT stuff for a couple decades but um, been working with ConnectWise for uh, boy, the first MSP was about uh, 13 years ago, so ago I think, uh, that I started working with ConnectWise. Is that right? Yeah, 12. Uh, LabTech has only been in the last four or so, three or four, um, but it's been a lot of fun, and I've enjoyed getting to know it. Um. It, it appears that uh, you're a little bit of a celebrity there, Darren. Um, people are professing their love for you, uh, understandably so, uh, throughout the chat, and uh, that's wonderful. Um, they claim that you don't ever sleep, um, which is which is nice. Uh, uh, <laughs> Gavin wants to marry you. Um, he may already be taken, Gavin. Um, I don't know how well that's going to go over. Yep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. He's taken. <laughs> um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Kyle. I've uh, been with my current company for four years now, and I've been working with LabTech for three of those years. Um, uh, I also manage our entire ConnectWise suite. Uh, anything to do with ConnectWise and its products is my responsibility. Uh, ConnectWise manage, automate, control. Uh, the ancient version of Quosol we're on, I also uh, have responsibility for, which is which is very very uh, unfortunate for me. Um, and uh, I hope to continue to do this for as long as possible because automating things is. Uh, it's fun, which is kind of sad sometimes. But uh, Tyler, what about you? Uh, so yeah, I'm Tyler. I've been with my current employer for three and a half years now. I got shoved into uh, lab tech from the get-go. So uh, it's been a very interesting journey as far as that. But uh, I also do manage our Screen Connect instance, which is now Connect. I'm sure everybody hates the difference, but we need to adapt. But yeah, so it's pretty basic uh everything's been from the geek so i'm sure most of us can kind of vouch for the same thing so uh yes admin life that is a dx racer chair um i i understand uh some people's preferences to to those to those uh types of chairs um but to, to kind of this is this is the first ever uh, podcast that we're doing, and it's an idea I had that Tyler's kind of ran with, um, and I, th I think it would be useful to have several prominent people from uh, the geek itself to talk about concepts and projects, ideas, uh, methodology for how they accomplish tasks, um, 
and anything ranging from business, um, you know, managing business processes and policies all the way to hand typing PowerShell code snippets to uh, rename a text file for some random reason. Um, and something just happened with uh, Skype <laughs> and killed everything. <laughs> and we're back. I just killed everything? Yes. Uh, that threw everything. Um, Sweet. <laughs> so, uh, that was I was fun. just looking for a nice way to take a drink and while I was off camera. <laughs> um, yeah, that uh, I just take a drink. That's what I do. I mean, they can they can see my nice. Uh, cut. I mean, you gotta let them know you're a little bit human, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, you subscribe to Totally Not Robots um, subreddit, don't you? Um, so. Uh, if uh, anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. We'll try to fit them in whenever we can. Um, there's a couple of topics we'll uh, we'll go through. Um, that's just a, a Coke can that surrounds uh, some type of alcohol. Um, there is 54 people currently watching this stream, which is pretty incredible. Um, so thanks everyone who wants to who who tunes in to watch four people talk about. Uh, automation in PowerShell and scripting and weird random stuff like that. Um, so to, to kind of kick this all off uh, officially, I guess, um, to ask you guys, what would be some basics uh, that you would recommend um, with Automate itself? Like what are some of the, like, some of the core f values and features that you think are needed with Automate? Um, I guess uh, I'll start here. Um, I would think your uh, key things you need to get down are searches and groups and how all those uh, work together. Uh, that's kind of your basis, I, I would think, for kind of most of lab tech. Everything kind of builds off of those search and group combos. Then, you know, all of your monitors and scripts and everything are, should then be applied to those groups. Um, knowing your difference between internal and external monitors, uh, you know, tracking stuff down um, is good. You know, before you're creating your own stuff, you're going to have to probably uh, debug the default stuff out of lab tech. Uh, so being able to quickly track down and find where tickets are getting generated from, uh, you know, where those alerts, where those monitor sets, where everything like that is coming from uh, is always kind of the first step I feel. Um, and it might be a little bit uh, easier for people, I guess, as well, because uh, you're kind of doing stuff maybe in uh, read-only type mode where maybe you're not necessarily modifying things, uh, but you can still dig around in there uh, and kind of see how everything's linking together. Uh, and from there, once you kind of understand the basis of how everything uh, goes together or how everything should be able to go together, uh, hopefully when you're trying to create your own solutions, um, you can kind of fit it into the framework that LabTech has already created for you uh, and you can have a better idea of where to put stuff so that in the future, uh, you know, for your future self when you're trying to find stuff, uh, you know where it is and uh, stuff's easier to track down, I guess. Um, you touched on a point that I'd, I'd like to, to go back to, um, and I've held this philosophy with if any application I've, I've supported, and uh, it, it's the basic philosophy I have is take your business and fit it into the application. Um, don't try to make the application fit your business only because it, it's probably not. Um, LabTech is highly customizable. It's uh, highly editable. You can change a whole bunch of stuff in it. But not every application is customizable as 
uh, lab tech is. And while you can do a lot to make lab tech fit your business, um, stuff like manage uh, is a lot more rigid in how it works. Um, screen connects the same way. Uh, and it's a, it's that going by that philosophy uh, when evaluating what we're gonna do and what steps we're gonna take has generally been a much better uh, received uh, notion um, and, and things that are presented to make the application do, as well as finding other applications that may work for us with alongside the ConnectY suite, um, uh, much easier to find. Uh, like when we were searching for an application, uh, you know, a documentation system, uh, we evaluated what we had, the options we had available, BizDocs, IT Glue, a couple others. And we settled that IT glue would close fit what our business would need, but we can also modify what our business does now and make it work for IT glue. Do any of you agree or disagree with that sentiment? Uh, yes or no, I guess. Uh, um, you know, you're always going to have needs that maybe don't fit, you know, a, a square need for a circle hole. Uh, so I guess you're always going to need to figure out how to uh, manipulate things and get things to work the way you want. Um, but I feel, at least for me, that's half the fun, I guess, is you get to kind of flex that creative muscle um, a little bit because sometimes you have to think of maybe a little unorthodox way to get the result you're looking for. Um, yeah, and I, you, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, it, it's more of a, a basic philosophy, and, and, and I definitely agree that sometimes you can make it the square peg fit in the round hole if you shave the corners off of it effectively. Um, even a triangle could fit in a big enough hole, but, you know, it, it's more of uh, going into finding that application and going into finding that solution. Um, uh, it, it's allowed us personally uh, as a company uh, to to better fit uh, applications and, and, and how we do things uh, from a procedure and process standpoint. Darren, you're going to say something? Uh, well, uh, the comment about making your business fit the product versus trying to make a product fit your business, um, I, uh, you know, I kind of want to say yes and no, you know, um, it is important, I think, to understand what a product can do, of course, um, and, you know, see where its limits are and if you can live with them, you know, work with them. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you spend all your time trying to make a product that, you know, you want to run your business a particular way, but the product really doesn't fit that way, um, then you can end up wasting a lot of energy. You know, you, you've got a platform that can do X, Y, Z, and you say, well, I'm really interested in Z, A, B. Um, you know, was that the right product or not? But if that's a product that you're going to stick with, then you try to make what you have work well within it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that Lab Tech can do and, you know, ConnectWise, Manage, and these different platforms. Um, I'll, you know, sp speak a little bit of an example of, uh, you know, we have, I I've worked with two different MSPs that use ConnectWise Manage, uh, for instance. And so one of them integrated all their invoicing, all their, um, you know, obviously ticketing, all, all these different systems within ConnectWise Manage really embraced the product. And um, I enjoyed working there and really felt it was productive. Um, uh, the other MSP is using ConnectWise to, you know, import emails and open tickets. And yes, it is a central point of contact management and other things, but are invoices being, you know, generated out of Manage? No. Um, are they doing inventory control, product ordering, you know, all these different things, sales forecasting opportunities? Uh, no, they're not doing those things. Um, and so there's a lot of the product that they're leaving behind because they've got the idea of we want our business to run this certain way. And instead of saying we're going to try to fit within the product, they're, you know, they're they're lost in some ways, so you know I can see that difference being in you know being in both 
positions. Uh, I can really see where you embrace your limits. Um, there are, you know, when when you're constrained, you know, there was a comment about creativity. I uh, think about artists, you know, Picasso and others, when you try to limit yourself to a single color, then your creativity really has to become manifest. Um, if you don't just say, yeah, we'll, we'll do everything. Um, how are you going to make, you know, what you have, the tool you have work? Um, then you can get some really cool creative solutions uh, that work well. Oh, yeah, that, that definitely some some good points. Um, what uh, we have a question that I'll, that I'll kind of slide into here. Um, uh, IT Norm wants to know what major components uh, you guys use around the ConnectY suite. Anything specific, maybe not uh, Nanite Pro or anything like that? Um, I myself am generally not a fan of plugins, really. Um, most plugins uh, are harder for me to support. If I have a problem with the plugin, if something's not working correctly, if I want to modify its functionality uh, or anything like that, it's harder to do than just you know raw scripts and monitors and stuff like that. Uh, and a lot of the plugins that are out really tackle kind of basic tasks that are fairly easy for you to do yourself. Um, so I might not be the best resource for this question, I guess, because maybe I have a, a bit different of feelings about plugins than others do. I was just taking a look at our environment. I see I've got 37 enabled plugins. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a lot of plugins. How many of those are not lab tech, though? Uh, let's see. Sort by uh, can I filter? Hey, I can filter. Look, we're um, learning as a group, guys. We're learning as a group. We can filter the plugin section. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if it's going to update the count, and it's not. A, it doesn't look like uh, a multi-select. It just well lets me pick one. That's because it's lab tech, and it doesn't give you all of the features you expect to have. Let's see. Um. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, probably about 10 or so. Uh, maybe 15 of these are actually third party. Most all of these I see say lab tech software, ConnectWise Automate. Yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of the the, the built in plugins. So, uh, plugs though, for any plugins, about the only ones that I really love and can fully uh, support, I guess, are like your custom tabs. Uh, custom tabs is awesome. That opens up a whole bunch of uh, customization for you in lab tech. Uh, a lot of ways to display data inside of lab tech still for your techs. Uh, that that plugin is awesome. Uh, in warranty master, uh, warranty master is awesome. It kind of just works. Um, uh, I just wish it had a way to stick in other serial numbers. So I, I, I found a solution for that. We have our ESX hosts. Uh, we wanted to get into our warranty master and I utilize lab tech and SQL to shove all that into where it will actually take it. Um, so I don't know if that's the same, a similar situation that you're facing. Um, but it, and I, I've even sent in numerous requests into, uh, like warranty master. Here's the exact SQL to run to pull a service tag out of, uh, infrastructure or, uh, virtualization manager uh, and all that sort of stuff but yeah i just, I but, just yeah, forced my hand like but uh slight plug for warranty master because at 40 bucks a month it's one of the most amazingest services you can ever have and their plugin's pretty top notch too <coughs> um if you want to sponsor lab tech geek we'll, <laughs> we're not saying we will say no but um so uh gav Gavin actually asked a uh, pretty interesting question. Um, what are you doing in uh, Automate that you don't think many others are doing with the product? Uh, networking and virtualization. Networking, like what? Do you, what specifically with networking? Um, 
I monitor everything I would need to networking. Um, I monitor my whole network stack from my fire, firewall switches, access points, NASs, uh, DRACs, uh, what, I don't know, anything that's important to me that's on my standard, uh, I monitor through uh, LabTech. Everybody seems to hate on LabTech for uh, all their networking stuff. Uh, but if you spend some time and you run through it, uh, it, it works just fine. Uh, and then nobody else seems to also use the virtualization manager. Um, but uh, again, both of those items need a lot of babysitting uh, to get working correctly. Um, I've had to build so many monitors and scripts and things to fix those products to work correctly that I'm sure a lot who just not put in that time and effort to do. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree on that front. Um, we we utilize the the ones uh, the virtualization manager, but it's only for getting the information. I built my own monitors and my own collectors outside of it, just because it's so unreliable. And you're missing like really basic ones, like is this ESX host offline? Um, uh, you know, and just like stuff that should be there um, is just not there. Um, so it, it's. I, I agree. Um, definitely agree with that point. Uh, do you use SNMP to, to, to record your networking traffic, Chris? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, not not uh, historical traffic like uh, graphs and stuff like that. I use uh, Cacti to do that, um, but to get alerts on like high utilization or something like that, I do yes. And I assume you use PowerShell for everything else? Uh, if I can, yes. <laughs> um, I, I do have one odd question. Uh, you are obviously an expert in PowerShell scripting. Uh, you're classified as an expert. There's no getting out of it. Um, have you ever thought about writing a plugin to do any of this stuff? Um, because PowerShell is very similar as far as its structure to, uh, to .NET. I was just curious if you ever thought about writing a plugin. Um, yes, I have thought about one, um, but about the only one I could think of would be very useful, would be pretty daunting. Um, I don't know, like I say, it seems like a lot, uh, a lot of plugins are very purpose built, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I like things that are very focused and very purpose built. Um, but I feel like if I were to make a lab tech plugin, it would be a very boring lab tech plugin because it would be a fix all the crap that lab tech should already be doing kind of plugin. It wouldn't be let me add new features. It would be let me fix all this broken features. So what you're saying is you want to be a millionaire overnight. <laughs> I guess so. everyone would buy that. Even one dollar <laughs> and every single lab tech subscriber would hear about it and you'd just you you just break in the cash yeah i don't know it's just hard to it's hard to dedicate all those resources to adding features to a product that still needs love in other places so a lot of times that love is spent uh, on not so glamorous things i guess you could say um we were getting a few questions uh, about the patch manager. Um, I don't know if we can cover that here. Uh, that's more for its own entire live stream on how to set up and run through and check and go through. Um, just because it's such a daunting uh, area that, uh, and it's so, so, so uh, just all over the place with, with uh, it's nerve wracking as coast Malone has put, uh, and I think that's going to be its own. Um, if you have a specific question, we might be able to answer it. But I, I wouldn't necessarily go uh, a, a broader question specifically about the patch manager. Um, so, admin life wants to know some of the uh, some of the things that we do to automate and streamline onboarding. Anyone have any tidbits on that? I guess I can uh, try and take <laughs> take a turn first. Um, uh, so, you know, I I believe in standardization. I believe in having you know 
processes that we we follow. I don't believe that people uh, the people do processes very well. If you give somebody a checklist of things to do, uh, they might follow it. They'll follow it enough maybe to get comfortable with it, and then uh, the next time they'll probably blow it off. You know because they think they know it. You know people just aren't machines, right? People don't do exactly what you ask them to do. Uh, so any standard configurations that we want to have in our workstations, you know, I want to have a script or some portion of a script that's dedicated to that. So as far as onboarding, you know, new agents, I have, uh, you know, kind of these mega scripts that just run through and call all these little, you know, little fix it type scripts, you know, a little script to, um, you know, change a firewall policy or, you know, enable or disable a service, just little things that technicians might need to do. Um, when we're onboarding a new machine, we want all these things to run. Uh, so just have a, a script that runs through all those steps. And the script has, you know, appropriate checkpoints and logic so that if it gets interrupted, it can pick back up where it was. Um, you know, at that, I call them stages, you know, so it'll jump back into that stage. If that stage includes a piece of uh, software that requires a reboot, it can reboot and then pick back up and say, okay, did it install successfully, uh, you know, and go from there. And so you can just kick the script off and then step away, you know. Um, so that that's onboarding a single agent, you know, that's not uh, onboarding a new client. Um, but that's that's one way that we leverage lab tech to help help smooth, you know, streamline things. Uh, yeah, and a lot of the the stuff that you do to onboard a single agent could also pass for onboarding an entire client. Um, maybe not a uh, push out all the software immediately and cripple your network and your processes and resources all at the same time. Um, but uh, uh, there is a, a good chance that. Um, some of the stuff overlaps. Um, so if you do, if you go on your own and build something similar, um, because I've had, uh, you know, uh, theories uh, and thought processes on how to do something similar to that um, and, and how I would structure it. Uh, I haven't written it yet, um, but that's one of the, it's one of the future tasks that uh, stuff just keeps adding on and adding on, you know, as, as us administrators and DevOps generally have to take care of. Um, Tyler, how do you guys uh, onboard agents and clients? Uh, a lot of it's manual, given we're a lot of small business, but uh, we do utilize um, like so some of the deployment tools for agents, uh, whether it's GPO or uh, just trying to push it with the LaTeX deploy school uh, deployment tool. Um, as far as onboarding, every it's it's kind of similar as Darren, just you know minor things that we we kind of ensure like. Um, local admin stuff like that um or you know firewall rules and whatnot just kind of small tweaks that we generally do and say an, an image uh, or a fresh machine uh just to kind of keep everything standardized or and you know obviously tweak per uh individual clients but um cookie cutter but not as with, with a little twist i guess uh -huh. Uh, I guess I take maybe a little bit different of approach to onboarding. Um, so, uh, to I hear a lot of people talk about how they want onboarding to you know kick off instantly as soon as I install this agent, yada yada yada. Uh, I take almost the exact opposite approach. Um, I put LabTech on the machine, uh, but onboarding doesn't run till a scheduled maintenance window. Um, I'm very disruptive with my onboarding. I try to use this onboarding opportunity to get all machines uh, set to a you know kind of standard in a certain level. I make sure every machine is 100% patched before it's considered onboarded. Uh, make sure every single tool, piece of software we use on there. Make sure PowerShell's up to all these little checks. Uh, restart your machine a million times. Uh, I try to. I try to take care of as much as possible in that onboarding phase so that as soon as we consider you onboarded, uh, your machine should meet every one of our standards. And if you're not meeting one of those standards, 
um, at that time during onboarding that should usually be kicked to kind of like a sales type opportunity uh, for an account manager to uh, you know talk about hardware sales or things like that for machines that aren't meeting uh, standards. Uh, that's, that's a very good approach. Um. I want to uh, follow up on something that uh, Tyler mentioned about uh, using the deployment tool or using GPO just to plug my favorite way of deploying, which is uh, through group policy. And part of the reason for that is I don't like using one tool for one stage and then another tool for another. If, you know, on an ongoing basis, how do I want the agents to get installed? You know, do I want to manually get an agent on each time or do I want to have an automated process where if a machine gets joined to the domain, that's within my control, my clients, you know, network, my administrative control. So I want to put an agent on there automatically. And so I like to have that framework in place and then, you know, leverage that instead of trying to reach out, um, you know, directly pushing the agent and maybe dealing with firewall issues or whatever, um, you know, use group policy and, and just let it do all the work. Part of that comes into our standards for clients. You know, in our business, we do have a standard that uh, you have a domain, you know, so we, we do target a certain size client base and have those minimum requirements. If a client doesn't have a domain, part of onboarding is going to be that they got to get it, you know, or we have to get that project done before we actually begin supporting them. So maybe that can't work for everyone, but, you know, with the clients that we target, that's the way we push. Uh, one thing that keeps coming up uh, that I would maybe like to mention that I feel is, I guess, uh, the basis to any successful MSP, uh, I guess, is my kind of three pillars, I guess you could say, are standardization, documentation, and automation. Um, if you don't have a standard hardware set, a standard network stack, a standard, you know, if you're not selling the exact same type of hardware to every single client, uh, your job as a as a lab tech admin is it going to be exponentially harder. Um, so now I don't have to make monitors for one type of switch. I have to make monitors for 30 kinds of switches. I don't have to make, you know, certain things to find NASs. Uh, you know, the, the more you can narrow it down and you can focus on a standard that meets your needs, uh, the easier your life is going to be because then you can spend the time to build all those bells and whistles uh, for that one product uh, that you're selling. Uh, you know, instead of selling or supporting any firewall under the sun, you you know, you have one brand or whatever that you support and you can build a whole suite based around that one uh, brand. Uh, you know, if you were to spend that same amount of time trying to do that for multiple brands, you would end up with a whole bunch of half-ass, you know, solutions instead of one that works well. Wholeheartedly agree on all those points. Um, we, we, at my company personally, we struggle with uh, standardization. Um, we're working to better ourselves with that, but that is just, it's just a struggle we've had. Um, it's never been really a, a strong point where, uh, where all of our engineers are focused. Um, but we're, we're moving in the right direction with that. Um, and uh, hopefully the other ones will fall in line right behind it. Uh, I'm answering in the channel, but I want to go ahead and say uh, some just uh, throwing things out of order here. <laughs> uh, but somebody said when we onboard a client, would we actually tell them to get rid of some new hardware? You know, like Chris was talking about having these standards. Absolutely. You know, so what that they just bought some, you know, brand new firewall. If that's not the firewall that uh, that we've standardized on, that each of our technicians are familiar with, that we have um, standard templates and documentation on how to set up, you know, we, we have all these things in place so that we can ensure the quality of our product. 
and they come along and say, well, I just bought, you know, Firewall X. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, you don't even have to apologize. You, you just say, you know, as part of your service, we're going to be providing this firewall. You know, this is a requirement for our service. And you should be able to, you know, speak positively and comfortably about it. You know, part of that is, of course, uh, you know, making sure that it, your sales reps and other people are educated about the product. But in my mind, if you've made a good choice as far as your standard, you should have no problem talking about how good a choice it is. You shouldn't have to apologize for the product that you want to deploy at a client's. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I know an individual who, uh, via lease program, will strip out every single thing a client has from switching firewall cabling to desktops, monitors, phones even, um, and sets them on a plan to replace them every three to five years, depending on what they want to select. And the, the amount of just hardware calls and just... St standardization because of that standardization and because of what you have that um it becomes your for your engineers and your team to just it, it's much easier for them to support oh they have a, a hard drive down well i've got one over here oh there's a motherboard down i've got another machine that's exactly like it sitting right over here i can just swap it out or i can and then export this one and now i have a backup it it makes it makes uh dealing with with stuff like that much more um difficult uh, much more easier to, to deal with um from, from a client standpoint it's a harder sell um when you're going into a client who just bought a, a brand new fire uh, cisco firewall and you're trying to put a palo alto in or something um it, it, it's going to be a difficult process but uh you, you you should be able to back up you know there's a reason why we standardize um and it's to make sure that you are supported the best way you can be supported and while you might feel Cisco is better than Palo Alto, we're standard on Palo Alto, and our team will be able to support you quicker, faster, better, more efficiently with Palo Alto. Yeah, you got to think that you know this stuff is saving you money. You know, uh, if you're an MSP and you're doing an all-you-can-eat type uh, agreement, you know, the longer it takes your techs to, you know, dink around with some piece of equipment that they're not familiar with, that's more support hours that you're having to eat. Um, and then, you know, as mentioned, if you have a standard uh, product, you can build documentation around it, you can have training around it, uh, and that's another good reason to uh, be picky and spend your time researching what you want your standard to be, um, because there are also a lot of hidden costs with these. So you've standardize on Palo Alto, they're your firewall. That's what you're selling forever. Then you change your mind, now you're selling Cisco's. You know, sure, that sounds easy enough, but you gotta think of all those hidden costs that come along with that. You're gonna have to retrain all your staff. You're gonna have to redo all your documentation. You're gonna have to redo all your monitor sets. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot that gets invested or, and a lot that comes from uh, choosing these standards as well. That, yeah, it, it's, it, it's when, uh, when you're, when you talk about standardization like this, um, it, it, it crosses into a realm to where eventually it just becomes, uh, common nature and, and you, it, it, it becomes training your new employees much easier. So if you do have employee turnover, you have full documentation on that one firewall you sell or that one switch, um, and uh, someone mentioned while you uh, may not be able to sell them end user hardware, it that's less of a concern, more of the stuff that you can support easily. 99% of all desktops are the exact same. Um, they're, they're, they're just going to have a different name on the front of them. Um, but when you get to stuff like firewalls and switching and server hardware and stuff like that, then it, that becomes much more uh, of a detailed conversation depending on if there's you get a three-year license and if the license cuts off at three years it shuts off the entire firewall or if it keeps working and stuff like that um but uh someone asked a question in here earlier which i lost uh what's one specific example that saves you the most time day to day uh. <laughs> closing slack 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because I guess uh, once I start saving time on it, it's now off my radar. I stop getting tickets and I forget about it. Uh, uh, what saves me time, I guess, uh, one of my least favorite things to do is probably what saves me the most amount of time, I guess, is documentation. Oh, God, yeah. uh, if, you, yes. if you don't want to be the only person to do a task, you have to teach somebody else to do that task. Um, and having good documentation on how to perform tasks is an easy way to kind of offload that task from you. Um, yeah, docu document your own processes. You know, if you don't want to do it, document it so somebody else can do it for you. Amen to that. Um, that documentation is probably the most important thing. Um, we switched from a SharePoint based uh, Excel notepad uh, word type format to IT glue. Um, <laughs> and it, it makes things much, much simpler, especially if you like, did you look at IT glue first? And nine, nine times out of 10, the answer is no. Um, and you just point them to IT glue, be very helpful. You can send them a link. Um, but it, it becomes searching for documentation much easier. Um, it's it's it it revolutionizes businesses to have accurate documentation um especially if when you, like, your lead engineer who's who knows how to do all this amazing stuff is out sick or on pto and this issue comes up and you can start documenting um his processes you can look and see if that's documented how he normally resolves issues and and you can maybe stumble the way through it but generally get it fixed um, documentation is probably almost important as a uh, ticketing system and an automation RMM tool at this point. Um, we've personally realized. Yeah, and then at the same point, though, um, I find the bad thing about that is a lot of times if a task is simple enough to document, it is also simple enough to automate. Um, so I have a ton of documentation that really all it does is tells you what a script is already doing for you. Um, so documentation is maybe a good starting point for automation. Um, maybe this is a segue into another topic here, I guess, but uh, a lot of times when I'm trying to uh, tackle a new task or uh, you know, wrap my head around how I might be able to automate something, um, going through kind of the documentation task of, uh, you know, what steps do I actually run through, uh, you know, break it down into little steps, and then each one of those little steps is, you know, easier for you to uh, manage and try to automate. Or even if you can't automate that whole entire process, maybe you can automate half of those steps or something like that. Uh, so I feel like documentation, is also a precursor kind of to automation as well. Um, IT Norm asked a, a, a pretty good question um, about tickets per agent. Uh, he says, does anyone make an attempt to minimize the number of tickets and is there a rule of thumb for number of tickets per 100 agents per month or anything along those lines? Uh, me personally, um, we target hours. Um, if your business is uh, above a th specific threshold of per hour, um, a dollar amount per hour, um, based on your contract and how many tickets our technicians are spending on that, um, that's our target metric. If we spend a thousand hours on automation, um, no one really cares from a financial standpoint about that. It's more of uh, how many, how much actual time our billable resources, our engineers are spending on on issues and resolutions. Um, so I don't have a, we don't go off of a specific, um, tickets per agents or anything like that, um, that we measure based stuff of. Uh, I'd say the same. We don't measure ticket volume. We measure hours. Um, we do measure man hours versus, uh, art hours differently. Um, we do try to bill for automation. Well, I guess we don't really build, but we, we account for hours so that we can show kind of like line items on a bill uh, to show value. 
Um, and I do kind of track tickets coming in versus hours spent um, to try to see. For me, that's kind of a metric of how well things are documented and maybe how well automation is working. Uh, for a lot of the tickets that I have some sort of automation tied around to, I will track those metrics as far as how many tickets I'm getting in versus how many hours. Uh, so there's a lot of times where, say, my ticket count will really jump up high, uh, but my hours count won't actually rise um, because a lot of the automation is really the one that's closing and fixing those tickets. Uh, so I guess I do kind of count ticket counts, but they're not really a, a main KPI that we go off of. Uh, admin life, you're going to uh, have to specify what AYCE is. I, the brain's just not... All you can eat? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's what he's, he's referring to, is just kind of oh. asking and getting kind of thing. Strictly community-based questions, I suppose. Uh, I mean, that, that so we, y yes, uh, from a standpoint, it, it's uh, we don't we the way we we price our contracts um, is it includes everything um, there the only separation would be projects versus non projects um, projects is an extra cost um, but generally everything else is already uh, taken care of um, from a from a standpoint um, I don't have any break fix customers I don't know if anyone else does on this cast. Um, I personally hate break fix customers because they're a waste of time. They don't ever want to pay and they're all cheap. Yeah, I have no break fix customers. Every customer is contracted. Um, I do have multiple levels of contracts though, depending on uh, how much you have covered. Uh, but I would say the majority of our customers are in all you can eat uh, type of support agreement. Same with us. That the you know the requirement to be under contract is um, an intentional barrier. You know because in my experience, there's always you know plenty of work, uh, and so there's always more work than you can handle. You know if you just take everyone that comes and says, "Hey, we want you to do this," you're you're going to drown. Um, so being able to say, you know, this is what you know we do if you want to talk about becoming a client you know this is the what we offer and you know actually take a look at engagement if they just want to tie you up for one project you know you you have to go through a lot of investment right to uh to learn and work with that client and if you're going to do that for one project um i hate to say unless you're going to make a ton of money don't do it because i want to just instead say don't do it you know, stick with the policy of, you know, we support these kinds of clients. This is what we do. We do it really well. And, you know, people will appreciate that. They'll either say, okay, what can we do? Or they go away and stop taking your time. So there's a lot of uh, chat, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> wow, uh, about all you can eat uh, ha happening um, and Think about it not from a financial standpoint. Think about it from your engineer's time. Um, how is your engineer going to know what's billable for what contract and when that's billable? Um, we we had a lot of issues just saying you got to know all 10 of our contracts uh, in and out and know what client uh, happens to be one of those 10, and then we can bill off of that. Um, we decided to... Uh, just go straight all you can eat um and it, it's it's much simpler on their end for putting in time and recording against that client um, because it doesn't necessarily matter if they're putting in ticket update slash communication so it doesn't kick out a bill or if it's putting in uh you know just a, a regular engineer uh, update or if it's a specific project engineer update or anything like that it's just much easier on their end so that they don't have to always know Okay, this client. I know specifically this client uh, covers regular work, and this client I have to be careful of what I select, and this client covers everything, and this one doesn't. It's just much easier from their standpoint to balance all their eggs when they're just trying to solve problems. Their their literal job is to just resolve all the tickets that come through, and it, it's just much easier from their point to have them 
have them have something uh, less to worry about. Yeah, you're, you're losing efficiency if every time a technician opens a ticket, they have to research the contract and try to determine, you know, what the status is and what they should do. And so, you know, yeah, all you can eat covers that. And, you know, again, it goes back to everything we've been talking about, about having these, you know, standard types of equipment, standard types of contracts, all these different standards, you know, help your technicians to be uh, the most efficient they can. They, they already have an implicit, you know, familiarity with a client, even if it's the first time they've talked with a particular user, worked on a particular machine, or handled a ticket for a particular client, if you're keeping it standard with all your other clients and contracts and everything, uh, they're going to be able to work, you know, very efficiently right in it. Um, another point, going back to uh, contracts, we had multiples, um, multiple different contracts, and we based it on unit counts. Um, but initially we didn't automate our unit counts because of reasons. Um, so at this point it becomes, well, what machines covered and what machines not? And how does my engineer know that what this machine's covered and this one's not? It's in lab tech. Does that mean it's covered? And if it's covered, is that getting built properly? It, it just, it saves so much headache and so much just time, um, just just to have that already done and just just work work the tickets make the clients happy close tickets do your best to resolve the problems document what you did and just be just be better in, in that regard don't worry about anything else uh some things i try to do is uh we generally only have i guess you could say three kinds of main contracts um, I generally name locations based off of the contract type they have. Um, so it's very easy for your techs to see what type of contract they have as they're drilling into the lab tech locations. Uh, they can see uh, you know, what contract right there from the location. Uh, and then also in ConnectWise, getting all of your agreements to default uh, to the correct type for the correct client is also good. And then making sure that when you change uh, your work types, that the agreements switch accordingly as well. Um, so we try to use lab tech, I guess, with the naming to make it very obvious. Um, you know, we make like not covered locations and things like that so that people obviously know that machines are not covered. Um, I am a heavy user of the covered under MSP contract EDF. Um, so there's there are plenty of ways for you to uh, mark these machines uh, and to automate that process. Awesome. I think. I mean, that's uh, uh, this. I think uh, everyone. Uh, this is turning out to be quite the uh, roundtable discussion here um, between all these people. Um, we have a lot of brain power uh, with everyone else besides me here. Um, so we're getting a lot of good questions, just just about MSPs in general and how they operate. And uh, uh, I think a good good section um is how to tie in all of the suite itself together um and, and make sure that you're you're properly utilizing the automate uh to manage plugins and that uh, uh your your connectwise control is properly mapped to lab tech and to manage and you have quilsaw integrated the much more integrated you become uh the, you find out stuff becomes easier um, and you start doing more and more uh, automation throughout your entire suite than you would with just a single application. Um, uh, I've tried to put it in several of our management's head that, um, you know, ConnectWise is our pillar and everything goes into ConnectWise. If it's not in ConnectWise, it didn't happen. No quote, didn't happen, it's not in ConnectWise um, because we have uh, everything going to ConnectWise, our accounting software, our control system, our uh, ConnectWise manage, I mean, considering 
I'm old school. Um, but uh, everything goes to manage, and uh, manage is the if it's in manage, that's the correct information it has. Um, and I don't know if you guys follow that philosophy as well. Well, and we keep talking about you know automation for our clients and our customers, uh, but there's so much automation you could do on your own internal stuff and your own processes uh, to save yourself and your colleagues so much time. Um, at least for me, it's a little bit more fulfilling as well, I guess, when I can uh, help one of my colleagues with their problems uh, or take out uh, you know, a mundane task that they don't like doing uh, and automate that portion of it for them. Um, so again, there's a lot of other places to look for this type of automation as well. Oh, uh, wholeheartedly agree, especially if you can find deficiencies, deficiencies, excuse me, um, in applications that don't necessarily exist. Um, kind of like when uh, I did a, a stream, the last stream I actually hosted um, about automating adding configurations to tickets because there's not a way in ConnectWise to do that. Um, and that's just, it's generally uh, a time saver for the engineers. And now we can do reporting on machines. Um, finding deficiencies and plugging those deficiencies um, internally where it's not necessarily client facing, um, it becomes a uh, uh, much easier to, to grasp. And then I think one of the upsides for automating your internal tasks is improving the efficiency of those things where you're not having to worry about getting them correct every time or somebody typoing, say, any sort of entry. You know, it's it's consistent every time. You, you don't have to worry, you know, three months down the line, well, was this put in correctly? You know what I mean? So that's, I, I guess it goes hand in hand, but uh, that's definitely, a, I think, a, an easier help yeah take your take the human out anywhere you, where you can uh, kind of like onboarding um, you probably notice there's a default monitor for you know client is not onboarded or whatever and really all that is is for the one checkbox but there's so many additional fields that you need to fill out a client in a location level uh, to get a client set up in lab tech so you know why stop with just that one checkbox so for onboarding, you know, I have monitors for every part of the mo onboarding. Is there a password set? Are they in maintenance plan? Is patching enabled? Is, you know, if any one of these things are not uh, done, that generates tickets uh, to complete the onboarding step. Um, again, anything you do regularly, setting up a network probe. You know, I don't set up a network probe. Lab tech detects a computer, picks a computer based off of some searches, automatically enables network probe, automatically sets it to scan networks, automatically sets up, uh, you know, all the pre-configured fills. You know, there's a lot of the stuff that you set up over and over and over and do the same way every time. And, you know, if you're doing it every time, I guess it's your own fault, but you, you don't have to. Um, so, uh, Noah's my bro asked a, uh, a question that I think everyone um, can get behind. Uh, their account reps uh, ignore their ConnectWise manage emails because they say they get too many. Um, and the solution to that is to fire them or have management discipline them because that's just stupid. Uh, if you use a tool, everyone has to follow that tool. I understand they make it a lot of emails but y you have to read them. I mean, it's n I read every email I get. I get a lot Sorry, of emails. Sorry, I got too many tickets. I'm going home. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's <laughs> just it's it's something that you, your management's just gonna have to to fight and and just crack down on. You can't you, that to me. That's just a uh, a stupid response to a question. Um, I don't feel like checking my emails on that. Well, I don't feel like paying you this week. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, 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 that's, that's my personal opinion on that subject. Uh, and it's, it's a hot one. I don't know if you can tell or not. Um, yeah. Um, account reps are bad, I guess. Um, I guess I really can't bash my account rep, uh, very bad. She's, 
uh, awesome. And anytime I really need her, uh, she picks up the phone and goes and yells at somebody for me. Um, but uh, connect to us for in general. Uh, admin life is dying to know uh, how many Ignite functions we are currently all using. Um, I use a ton of Ignite features, actually. Um, so I take the approach that most people are told to do, kind of. Um, let's say you get your fur, you know, fresh lab tech instance, all your monitors are turned on, you're getting a whole crap load of noise. Uh, go through, disable all your noise, uh, find what tickets you really want, you know, start working them. So then what happens is you then automate all those tickets that you're getting and you stop getting noise. So then you start turning on more of these monitors again. You start getting more noise. You filter out that noise, you automate that noise, you know, just kind of a constant rinse and repeat. Uh, so as you're fixing one problem, you're just turning on another one, kind of. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people's solution to the noise is to turn it off, and that you kind of want yeah. more. You, it's back on, though. Yeah, it, yeah. it's. Uh, if there's a major problem that's generating you a thousand tickets, yeah, maybe you can turn that off, but you need to go through and fix those problems that are causing those, either by adjusting the monitor or, uh, you know, resolving the problem at hand. Uh, yes, I am running a Corsair mechanical keyboard with blue switches, um, for those of you who can hear my clicky clacky. <laughs> um, I apologize if it's too loud. I'll try to type, twi type quieter. Um, I'll do my I'll do my best. You need to get those browns, man. No, nah, I love the clicky clacky. <laughs> um. So, uh, let Let's see if uh, I haven't seen any other questions. So I, I'll I'll figure out. Uh, is there any uh, mm -hmm. projects that you're currently working on that you'd like to share with the uh, the the fifty plus people who are watching and typing and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, any current projects you happen to be working on that you want to brag about? Um, well, I guess I've already been discussing some of it, but um, with the um, addition of IT glue flexible assets, um, even though it's not all the way there, we don't quite have update and delete options yet, but um, I am kind of making an auto document everything type process. Um, so LabTech runs a lot of detection type scripts, compiles all that information and creates automatically some glue documentation for you. Um, that's amazing. Uh, are you willing to share? This is probably the second question that we're gonna get. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll how, see about How it. many beers at IT Nation does it take to bribe you to release some of your PowerShell scripts? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll see uh, how many does it take to have me crawl on the floor. I guess. Uh, well, I can. I mean, we can go straight to straight liquor if you want to go that far. <laughs> Two or three shots. We'll we'll make it that way. Um, this is a good question. Uh, how do you onboard new users internally to LabTech? Um, what kind of training and stuff you do and uh, how do you get them prepared to work in lab tech? Uh, for me, most of my techs um, probably don't utilize lab tech fully in the sense you might think about it. Um, a lot of my techs are still doing remote support. A lot of them are still connecting to machines, still manually going through processes. Um, it's more about just trying to familiarize them with where to pull information out of LabTech, how to search for scripts, um, you know, uh, having constant, uh, I do some metrics based off of text that run scripts. I have uh, some dashboards that say, you know, what script was ran by what user, how many times, how many different scripts did they run, how many different computers did it hit, yada, yada, yada. And we'll kind of give out 
um, incentives to people that utilize scripting to help save them time. Um, so other than that, that's about almost all my end users really use out of LabTech is information gathering and running pre-created scripts. Um, there is, uh, I guess, a different department that does more uh, of stuff in LabTech, but most of our, uh, you know, most of our work source, uh, workforce is not really utilizing a ton of LabTech, you could say. Um. Yeah, so you empower your users to write scripts? Uh, no. Uh, select users we do, yes. Um, and any scripts that users create has have to go through kind of an internal vetting process, uh, you know, just to make sure we don't have some bad script format in the C drive or something. Uh, completely understand. Uh, I'm the only one who's allowed to write a script in my company because I don't trust any other people to do it. Um, <laughs> yep. So uh, another very interesting point that's kind of going to uh, probably drag uh, Gavin around, uh, data gathering. Um, you, you really can't fully utilize anything without having a measurable data set. Um, so how do you guys uh, utilize data in your, you know, to help your, either your, your engineering staff or, or yourselves um, get through the day? Do you guys have like dashboards displayed or anything along those lines or just reports that you run daily or have emailed to you? Uh, yeah, so I use dashboards to uh, monitor my key things that I am responsible for, uh, like uh, pretty much anything that's automated. So uh, I have dashboards for things like how many scripts are currently running, how many commands are currently running, how many machines are currently updating, how many machines updated today, how many machines failed during their updates, all sorts of stuff like that, uh, how many active infections there are uh, on machines, uh, all your backup failures, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then most of our service desk usually just goes off of a ticket-based kind of KPI. How many tickets did you close throughout the day? Um, what are your um, you know, customer survey scores? Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you use to display your dashboards? Um, we currently use quite a few things. Um, <sighs> Uh, it's kind of funny that, you know, I built a bunch of uh, dashes and things myself, um, and then the boss ended up buying Bright Gauge because he wanted somebody else in the office to do dashing, uh, and Bright Gauge was more accessible for them to do it, um, yet they still got stuck, and now I manage Bright Gauge as well. So most everything's in Bright Gauge. Uh, makes sense. Uh, I personally use dashing, um, which is now smashing uh, the fork of it, uh, and I use it to pretty good effect. I have it tied into just about any database I can get my hands on and pull data from. Um, uh, do you, Darren or Tyler, use any other type of dashboard displaying software? Uh, we, I was going to say, we're... Uh we're not a good example <laughs> in that regard, unfortunately. Um, you know, there's things that I, I think that we do, you know, we do right, we do well. Um, and there's things that, you know, we have room for improvement. And that, um, you know, dashboards, reports, you know, uh, both internal and customer facing, we do have room for growth. And uh, people that have, talk with me a little more about the direction our business is going probably aren't surprised uh, to hear that that's an area that we're uh, we're not stellar in you know the way that we'd like to be um, as far as what one of the earlier comments about gathering information um, data views are a great way uh, to get information you know if you're not using data views um, I, I guess for individual machines, data views, you know, probably aren't uh, going to be as big of a thing. But anytime you're trying to get an overview of a client, overview of a group of machines, um, you know, there's a lot of information that is pretty readily accessible through data views. 
and uh, that that's a good way to you know get to see things, visualize and and play around without needing to you know really get your hands into SQL. You know, not everyone uh, is, thinks you know native SQL queries, and so data views are a good way to get your head around that. Uh, one comment here is about uh, documenting your scripts in the script notes. Um, I would say nay to that. I I don't like putting stuff into lab tech. So for me, if I'm writing a script, I don't want to put notes in the script in lab tech. What I want to do is I want to put a link to a glue article in that script. Glue is my documentation. Lab tech is not my documentation. I agree with that. Um, it's like having all your eggs in one basket. It's just it's not a it's not necessarily a good practice. Um, especially if it's a system that's not necessarily designed to handle that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Writing comments in your script to help kind of point you in the right direction of what a specific section does, I can recommend. But documenting how it, it works and why it works and stuff like that um, might not necessarily be the best idea. But if it works for you, hey, good job. Well, I, I, I think I might see the comment that Chris was was mentioning and um, there, there is a valid point about in the script, you know, notes of the script comments, the script description, uh, go ahead and include some information. You know, uh, if you've got a, a script that, uh, let me just pop this open and see if I've got one that's, you know, not so useful. Well, here's one, uh, AD gather DC diag. You know, what What do you expect that script to do? Is it going to, you know, email a user? Is it going to run it across all the domain controllers? You know, you know, what exactly is that script? You can't include all the information about the script just in the script name. And so, you know, putting some good notes in that so that someone else that wants to run the script can understand what it does uh, is good. But I think going you know, back to... Don't, Chris's, uh, what he was saying is since he utilizes it to go as his documentation system, he writes the entire process of what that script does and how it works and then links that uh, to the script notes. So if you have a question about what the script does or how it does, you just open that link or click on it. Um, and I assume whoever would ever want to have, have access to it. Um, that way you're, you're doing it, but it's much more managed, uh, much more managed system for it. Now, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely agree having some type of information in that section is, is very useful, um, but I wouldn't necessarily document the entire script there, personally. Uh, another really useful tip uh, for your script kind of notes or description section there uh, that I stole from Martin is uh, I put a kind of a unique identifier inside of my descriptions for each script. Uh, so that I can use it almost as kind of like a security group. Um, one of the things that really sucks about LabTech scripting is the permissions. Um, you can only set permissions one script at a time, essentially. So what I do is I put in some sort of key identifier in that uh, message so that I can then SQL for that message and apply uh, permissions to all those scripts based off of uh, key items that are in that field. That's a good point. Um, do you have any more, Darren or Tyler, on uh, scripting documentation? I do a similar. I, I, I keep everything documented. Uh, it's it's in SharePoint, sadly, but uh, I mean, everything's... How dare uh, you? <laughs> and look, IT glue's trying to come, but, uh, you know, it's a slow process. But, uh, yeah, I mean... Everything, uh, all of our custom scripts are, are labeled out uh, in folders and in sh in a, a SharePoint document as well. You know, pretty much summing up. Well, you know, this does this. Uh, some of the more advanced ones do have a more in depth of what certain lines do in the event that uh, it's something that needs to be modified. Uh, so, say it's a software installer or something like that. We'll have what needs to be changed in the event that it needs to get modernized or. Swap, swapped up for whatever reason, but um, that's pretty much. Um, uh, 
someone put a comment about how they can uh, utilize dashboards and stuff if you're uh, not on premises. Um, first off, if you're not on premises, I apologize. Um, uh, being cloud hosted uh, is 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 very bad, um, in my personal opinion. Uh, everything I've heard about it is just slow and terrible and whatnot. But uh, uh, I think Engage will integrate just fine with hosted. Um, um, good point. Good point. Uh, uh, so, it's uh, you can also utilize the APIs to get data and build your own metrics. Um, it, it's not as going to be as efficient as writing SQL code, but uh, you can still build it off of uh, if you want to write your own. Um, I think Grafana has API calls you can do. Um, you'd have to learn uh, the ConnectWise REST APIs. Um, I don't know anything about the manage a or the automate APIs because, as far as I know, they don't exist. Uh, at least not until there's a document that says here has to access them. Um, but uh, I think uh, uh, there, there's always ways around um, getting the data you need. Uh, data views are definitely highly important. Um, if you never played around with the data view editor, you can. Uh, I think it's in the tools menu, if I remember correctly. Um, I just uh, use searches a lot of times in place of data views because uh, I find that they're a lot easier to build uh, than a data view. And I feel that for the most part, you get all the functionality of a data view in a search, essentially. I, I, I agree. I don't like the data view creator. I hate it. Um, I show people how to use the data views that are already built, but it's just, it feels cumbersome for uh, what it does. Um, and considering it hasn't been updated since, uh, I don't know, like Lab Tech 2012. Dot, no, 2012, probably a little sooner than that. I think I remember them hiding the editor in dot one and then having to reopen it in 2013. Um, Um, as Martin mentioned there, back to again, glue and documentation, uh, that is kind of one of our standard or one of our requirements for something to be able to push to production is if that script ever creates a ticket, um, it needs to have a glue link in it. Um, even if right now that glue link is a blank document, that ticket gets generated with that glue link in it for somebody down the road to fill that document out. Um, but at least the automation is creating a ticket with a link to somewhere. Like I say, even if it's a blank page, link it to somewhere, because then somebody later down the road can fill that document out for you. Um, we got a couple of good questions. Uh, how do we go about offline server notifications? Um, I've got a two-step method. Um, I wrote, this is, uh, I designed it. Uh, Michael Priest actually helped me get this fully up and running. Uh, before LabTech had their heartbeat monitor, uh, I included, I wrote my own monitor with uh, Michael to help me uh, include that section in there. And uh, Martin actually uh, sent me something um, quite nice, uh, which I utilize minus the Slack piece. Uh, so basically it's a, uh, something that I was messing with, but hadn't gotten as far as he had. Uh, it's a script that runs and does a whole lot of great stuff. Um, like seeing if the entire location's offline, um, and if the entire location is not offline, let's see if we can't ping that server. If we can ping the server, uh, let's see if we can't remotely using PS exec to restart the lab tech service because obviously the lab tech service died. Um, that should have built into the default offline script. What? That that's already built into your default offline script out of box. Yeah. See, I'm too old school. I didn't even know that existed. I just wrote my own. Um, and uh, so it, it does that, and then it, uh, if that fails, uh, for some reason it can't, it attempts to utilize Screen Connect, utilizing Big Desserts, RMM Plus, uh, and restarts the agent via Screen Connect. Um, and if uh, all else fails, it opens a ticket, and then the engineer jumps on it. 
Uh, I do roughly the same thing. Um, I don't utilize plugin. Again, not a big plugin fan, uh, but I do roughly the same thing. I just query the Screen Connect uh, through their API to see if the machine's online. If not, I resend it a uh, command to restart the service. I then check back in again to LabTech. If the agent is still offline in LabTech, I then go back to Screen Connect and I reinstall the agent uh, using the PowerShell module, uh, you know, also to restart the agent as well through the PowerShell module. Uh, uh, then even after the agent has been reinstalled, if it still can't check in, it then gathers the logs from the machine uh, using Screen Connect and then attaches those to the ticket. So um, that's that very thorough. This, I utilize uh, Ops Genie to uh, trigger stuff for like after hours and things like that. Uh, so that I can have a call escalation path um, and things like that. Uh, and utilizing the API uh, helps you do things like uh, update the status of tickets for the on-call tech, um, auto-close tickets that are self-resolving, uh, stuff like that. Um, I think the, the uh, I, I think that's a, a good process to follow is to to find other resolutions to bouncing that agent and verifying that the the agent is the actual cause of the um, the outage. Um, we had a lot of issues with false alerts, um, and it, it's just the agent being the agent. So uh, it, it's definitely helped us personally. Uh, and then, kind of to your note, also as far as the offline. Uh, location alerts. Um, again, standardization is nice. So we get an offline location alert. We already have all the router information. Uh, so we can then have our lab tech server, uh, you know, try to ping their router. If we can ping it, you know, we try to SSH into the router and make sure it can get out. If not, we try to restart the router. Uh, you know, if we can't get to the router, we dump out a trace route into the ticket. Um, and that's another good point too. Is um, is someone writing even, this down? Because I need to. I'm gonna have to remember this tomorrow. Even if you can't automate a process, um, it is good to at least gather information. So I do that a lot with scripts as well. So let's say there's a location offline. Um, there, I can't ping their switch. You know, their router. Uh, so then I just, I already have their ISP documented in LabTech. I have, uh, you know, a trace route that goes out. So I'll automatically dump into the ticket, hey, this customer with this ISP, uh, you know, is down. Here's the trace route, how far we got to that customer. And here's a list of all the other customers that have this same ISP. Um, and that's another great thing to do because then we can inform our other clients of potential outages or if we see a bunch of clients all go offline at the same time, they all have the same ISP, uh, we can kind of connect those dots. Yeah, somebody notate that and email it to me, um, specifically, step by step. Or you can just send me your script. Uh, I'll, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to complain. Um, uh, speaking of scripts, uh, how do you guys f f form your scripts? Um, I know a, a lot of s some some of the things you do in scripts are, are repeated over and over, and I know you can add scripts and do, like for me, I have automation scripts that record time on tickets, and I don't uh, rewrite that step every single time. I have little scriptlets that run. Um, that create tickets and update time to tickets and stuff like that. Um, how do you guys, how do you guys do that? Um, did I, uh, sorry. Yeah. If moving windows around, I couldn't remember if I was muted or not before I just start talking. So, um, scriptlets, uh, are, you know, indispensable, you know, when you have repeated steps that you run, uh, being able to just quickly insert, um, I, you know, there's certain processes that I think are maybe trouble prone, uh, maybe not, but, you know, as an example, 
just doing a SQL loop. Uh, you know, it's not super difficult if you've done them, but if you want to write a SQL loop from scratch every time, you know, obviously that's going to be a lot slower. You know, when I need to do a SQL loop, I right click insert a scriptlet that has a, a, you know, a variable for the query has, you know, basically an insert query here statement has, you know, some stock, you know, kind of logging output, you know, here I am in the loop, you know, loop exiting, just, you know, the outline, the skeleton of what I need. And then I can put in the query I need, you know, change what the individual steps are, et cetera, um, without having to deal with, you know, is my logic correct about, you know, do I check the number of records before I increment my loop counter or after, or, you know, because there's different ways you can do it. And just inserting that stock scriptlet, you know, keeps it, uh, keeps it tidy. Um, not only that point, but if you have a scriptlet that's used everywhere, um, let's say, for example, you know, your SQL, and let's say something changes in LabTech's database that doesn't allow that to run. If you have that hand-coded every single time in a script, you have to go through every one of those scripts and change it every single time. But with your script... Well, let, me stop, let me stop you there, because I guess uh, I was going to kind of make that point, is scriptlets have that limitation. Is a scriptlet is saved, so once you right-click and insert, you know, scriptlet and you save that script, it is stuck. Script functions are where it's at. So something like Darren mentioned as like a SQL loop, that's a great thing to have is a script lit because you're inserting it and then you're modifying it to meet your needs. But if you're really needing to do the same function over and over and over, scriptlets are not good. Scriptlets, uh, I would say the function scripts are what you want. Um, because then, like you said, if later down the road something changes, um, you can go back and change that one function script, and now all the ones that reference it get updated. Whereas your scriptlet uh, will not. You know, your scriptlet, once you've inserted it in there, it's, it's stuck how you put it. Um, everyone is commenting on you standing up um, and how, how important you are. Yeah, there you go. Look, look at that. <laughs> I'd say give you a round of applause, but that you wouldn't hear them clapping. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, they both have their places, um, but it, it, I prefer the functionality of script functions over scriptlets, um, just just in how I write my scripts. Um, oh, oh, look, they're putting the hands. I, there's a there's a clap emoji. <laughs> didn't even didn't even realize that. Uh, still can't hear. I, I'm gonna. Zaf uh, said exactly what I was going to point out. Um, you know, some of the scriptlets, you know, I have. So, for example, when you want to download a file, you know, what are the steps? You put, you know, I want to download a file, put in the URL and the, where I save it. Well, does the folder exist? Has the file already been downloaded? Uh, after it's downloaded, do I check if the file's there? You know, what is you know, kind of conceptually, you know, simple one liner, I just want to download a file, you know, to actually follow all the steps is kind of involved. Uh, so I've got a function script that I've been kind of tweaking on for years that it should be published at the geek for uh, a file download script that uh, will do MD5 checksum verifications will check minimum maximum size of the file to make sure that it's, you know, valid. Uh, you know, run into problems with uh, content filtering or something else, maybe aborting a download. So you get get the exe, but uh, exe is 2K. You know, uh, why isn't the installer working? Well, you know, the exe is bad. Um, and so that functionality is driven, you know, I have a scriptlet that gets me started, but it, it's to call that function. To call the function, I have to define certain variables. You know, so how do I remember which variables are for the minimum size or maximum or whatever? I have a scriptlet that has all those for the example. You know, so I insert it, comment out what I don't need or, you know, whatever, uh, make the adjustments. And, you know, very quickly I have, you know, a few basic lines that call the function script. Uh, the function script goes and does a bunch of heavy lifting. 
uh, comes back. But over time, I've added features, you know, such as automated uh, retries of download. Or, you know, if it detects that there's a problem with the file, go ahead and delete it and try it again. Um, if it's a zip file, go ahead and extract it. Uh, those are all features that I added to that simple download script. But because it wasn't a scriptlet, you know, because those features weren't hard coded in my original scripts, every script that's ever used that function script still works. It's, you know, uh, I guess forwards, backwards, compatible, whatever you want to say. Uh, as I've added new features and new variables to unlock those features to that function script, all the old scripts still work and some of them just work better, you know, uh, improving its ability, like I said, to retry downloads and stuff like that. If you wanted to go through and add an auto retry to every file download you ever added to a script, if you hard coded them with scriptlets, it's a ton of work. If you call a function script and let it do that work, um, it makes it better. Uh, yeah, I see you mentioned LT get file. Um, yeah. Uh, as a side note, uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna segue into uh, the new labs at Geek Forms here real quick. Um, to, to those of you who know, there is a download section uh, available now um, that we're gonna be hopefully utilizing more and more. Um, uh, obviously, these two gentlemen that I have the pleasure of speaking with this evening will be uh, allowed access to upload files to that service. Um, we do have a forum API. We're not going to do anything with that currently, uh, maybe in the future. Uh, but the download section, uh, if you'd like to contribute to the download section, if you feel you have something to contribute, please reach out to one of the uh, many, many administrators, uh, first and second class, um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that are available. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that we can... We're going to slowly roll it out so that uh, we can make sure that nothing breaks on our end uh with the host and everything um but going back on topic um script functions definitely um i want to mention another uh script script lit and script function um i like you know emailing in fact it's in the documentation there's an example of emailing you know information to the user that ran the script uh, so you can write that from scratch every time, which obviously is bad. Uh, you can have a scriptlet that runs through the steps. Um, or in my case, I have a scriptlet that just has a framework that calls a function script that actually sends the email. Uh, you know, again, leveraging the, the function script. Um, I will set a variable um, called add info, additional info. And I will repeatedly set that variable, um, basically add info equals add info and then some more information at the end. Uh, so I keep adding to it. Instead of logging, you know, one line here, one line there in the script log, and then a user having to go through and review the script log to see, you know, what did the script do? Uh, I carry all that in a variable and then at the end, you know, email that to the user that says, I tried to do this, this was the result of this shell command, you know, was there an error, you know, whatever. And so the email will just be a, a run through of everything the script did, um, or that can be stuck into a ticket. Um, you know, but part of the reason why I, I do that in most of my scripts is because I have the scriptlets, you know, in place that make it easy. If I didn't have that there, I, I might neglect to use this as, as often as I do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and utilizing those functions and stuff is, is basically automating your automation. <coughs> That's how I like to phrase it anyway. Uh, one thing maybe to note on that, um, for those that maybe care about scaling, uh, maybe I'm just too crazy about database cleanup, but uh, I really try not to use script logging. Um, I, 
as you guys know, I'm a PowerShell fanboy, so I really try to take the PowerShell kind of approach to my lab tech scripts. Um, if a script completes successfully, there is no output. The only time I'm logging anything is if there's an error or failure uh, or something like that. Um, when you start to scale and you have tens of thousands of agents and you're running millions of scripts a day, um, your commands and script log history tables get huge. Screw your event logs table. You know, those things will get huge if you start logging a ton of stuff. So maybe take that with a grain of salt or you know, how many agents you have or how much you care about your database speed. Let's ask that question. Um, how many agents do each of you guys support? Uh, I'm at about 4K myself. Uh, right now, well, that's maybe a hard question to uh, My company, I support 7,500 agents. Uh, we just have 1,500. Uh, we're at 1,800. Oh, so you guys have it easy. <laughs> Give or take. Um, but uh, that that's a that's a definitely an interesting approach, uh, Chris. I I didn't even you know that didn't even occur to me. Um, uh, I'll have to have someone write that down and email that to me too as well. Um, Uh, so we're 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 sitting pretty right now um, with uh, all the questions. I think we answered just about every one of them that comes uh, through. Um, I don't see any more come through yet, so we can get back on to uh, where we were at. I can find it again. Um, anything you guys want to work on that you haven't worked on yet? Uh, any any future future ideas that you guys have percolating that you may want to maybe get some external input on or anything like that? Uh, automate everything. <laughs> it, <laughs> in, uh, like, I don't know. That's really, I guess, my goal pretty much every morning is if I get a ticket that gets assigned to me, I try to make it so I just never get that ticket again. Um, I've pretty much got most of the normal knock type stuff pretty ironed out here, so now I'm starting to uh, help some of our project engineers, and lately I've been doing, uh, like I say, a lot more kind of internal automation, helping our own internal departments work work more efficiently. So I've got a question for you, Chris. Um, do you have a PowerShell script that writes lab tech scripts? No, I, no, that would be the totally backwards. Uh, you know, uh, for me, I try to do as little scripting in lab tech as I can, and I try to put all of it into PowerShell, as much of it as I can. Um, if, if you're familiar with another type of uh, programming language, you know, if you're good at Bash or Visual Basic or Python or whatever you're, ha you know, that's going to probably be really a better, more robust solution than lab tech is going to be. Your lab tech scripting, while it is pretty powerful, it is kind of training wheels, and it is hard to share. It's hard to version control. It's hard to, you know, all these, uh, <laughs> uh, all these great, you know, dev tools you don't get access to through kind of lab tech type scripting. Uh, so I don't, want to say it, I've kind of maybe graduated or moved past, I guess, lab tech scripting. Um, but but really, I, I try to put as much of my logic, as much as everything as I can into PowerShell. So I'm kind of just using lab tech to push PowerShell, retrieve results, and kind of action on. Uh, I mean, and that, that makes a, a lot of sense, um, especially you know going outside of what you have available to make it more robust and, and, and more feature rich. Um, Cause lab tech scripting uh, is quite powerful, but the more you get out of uh, utilizing it to transport more powerful stuff, uh, it just, it becomes uh, much more uh, of a tool um, than, than standard. Um, utilizing 
PowerShell, Python, uh, JavaScript, um, any, any, anything that you can utilize to get other information that not isn't necessarily easy to gather outside of or inside of the script engine, um, it, 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 it graduates you to another level, um, especially if there's something that's either slow or doesn't work as efficiently as you need it to. Um, so uh, to all the other people in there, don't forget, don't, don't be afraid to think outside the box and outside of lab tech. Uh, to the point of uh, scaling, you know, the more that you can leverage or the more you can offload on the individual agents, you know, say by pushing a, a PowerShell script and then letting it, you know, make some decisions about what to do, you know, do you need to check and see if the software is installed in lab tech or can PowerShell test for that? And obviously PowerShell can test for that really easily. If the end result is you're still going to send some, you know, PowerShell blob and have it do a bunch of stuff, why not, you know, go ahead and put all that stuff in? Um, you know, that makes your lab tech script really simple, right? It, it just pushes the PowerShell and lets the PowerShell do its thing. Um, mm -hmm. But that also helps with scaling. The script engine in 10.5 compared to 11 was pretty terrible, I think. But, um, y you know, there's probably a lot of people that even with lab tech 11, have enough agents that they still feel how slow it is, or they, they still feel, you know, uh, they feel penalties when they stay within the lab tech engine. Um, it, it's, you know, hardly any penalty to send a PowerShell script versus say, just checking to see if a file exists. You know, it might be one or 2K more of data to send the whole script that might be a dozen or two commands <laughs> Uh, you know, versus using a lab tech script to say, does this file exist? You know, all these little back and forth that just take so much time. Um, that's really going to make things fly. Uh, so counter to your point of the script engine and 10.5, this used to be mandatory. Um, but now I feel it's still a good just kind of best practice that I do all the time is I will push like a lab tech script or something or a PowerShell script to a machine, let's say, um, you know, to download a file, right? So let's say I'm downloading a two gig file or something like that. Lab tech is going to time out. That script is going to be plugged up in my script engine for the entire time that it's trying to download that file. Um, so I've done this with all sorts of scripts and all the time is if anything is going to take a long time, I always have it, you know, execute script don't wait, continue immediately. And then all I do is schedule the script to check back on itself in 10, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, so then it clears that script out of the script queue. It cleans up uh, you know, your script engine. Then 10 minutes later, it comes back and checks, hey, are you done with that process? Yes or no, you know, and kind of keeps scheduling little checkups for itself. So you're not plugging up the script engine while you're waiting for that process to run. Uh, earlier, one of the questions about, you know, is there anything I'm uh, proud of or I think is really cool that I'm doing in lab tech that, you know, maybe other people aren't. And I looked around and there wasn't a whole lot that I saw that I'm like, hey, this is really neat that I'm doing in lab tech. Um, some of the things that I think are kind of cool are things that I did in, you know, batch or VBS, you know, even before I was involved in lab tech, um, have, you know, okay, I need to follow this process. Well, I don't want a document that says what to do. I want a script, you know, a batch script or some other script that's going to run through and predictably do these things. Uh, so, you know, I've brought some of those things into lab tech um, but lab tech isn't really doing anything other than just carrying along that power. Um, one, one example, uh, another technician was, uh, pretty stoked when he saw it work is migrating a DHCP server. Um, everyone here that knows how to do it right knows it's not that hard. And we all hate people that don't know how to do it right. Um, if you don't move over the active leases, you get conflicts, it's a mess. Um, it's not that hard to properly back up and export the database. 
so anyways, I, you know, have a script that I can run, uh, on the, uh, new DHCP server. All I have to do is tell it the name of the old server, give it a username, password, you know, some kind of credentials. And it pushes over a script bundle that connects over to the other server, stops the service, grabs the database, all that. I, uh, migrating DHCP is a script, a couple pieces of data, and run and go away. And come back, it's done and done right. Um, that's better than handing a, a technician a document that they're probably not going to follow correctly. Um, but, you know, all that logic, that was all stuff that was... I had already done that outside of lab tech. Um, I think Chris probably has that, you know, similar experience with you create a powerful, uh, you know, PowerShell script that can, uh, you know, accomplish some important task. It's easy to integrate into lab tech if the script is doing all the work. Lab tech is just facilitating that, moving it around for you. And then also really if you want a long and prosperous career as an admin type, uh, learning uh, a different type of programming or scripting language is probably going to be more beneficial to you in your career than learning a lot of lab tech specific type things. Um, you can take a lot of this same type of knowledge and integrate it into lab tech. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, but not, not only to that point, but the logic that you utilize when you're scripting in PowerShell or stuff is easily transferred into other languages. You're using different ways to do the same logic, but it's all still the same at the core. Um, instead of doing uh, print line, you may do echo or, you know, it, it's, it's all the same. It's just worded differently, but the logic's all the same regarding of what programming language you're at. Yeah. Syntax. Thank you. Um, and, and on that note, uh, we will be taking a short break. Uh, I think we're, we've been currently been running for two hours live. Uh, so I think a good break is well deserved. Uh, we'll come back and uh, wrap everything up, uh, answer a few more questions and uh, see where we go from there. And we're back. Uh, let me turn on Skype for everybody so that everybody can hear Skype now. And it's on, and we should be good. Um, hi, guys. Uh, the, the peeing went well. Um, we have all peed. Uh, and and then some. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll read up in chat to see if I see any, uh, see any great questions. Um, so far, a lot of questions about Gav doing Report Center. Um, the more you poke him, the quicker he'll do it. So please at him as much as possible at all times of the night. He sleeps normally between uh, 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so feel free to at him at any point in time during that time. Uh, let's see. Uh, Darren, did you migrate FISMA rolls ever? Uh, well, I've migrated, but I've never scripted that. Uh, I did create scripts and outline and procedure for um, staging a domain controller for uh, ADMT, uh, basically to migrate from like dot .local to a, a valid domain. Um, but uh, that's still, again, that's not really inside lab tech. You know, that's just uh, processes that I've done and documented and followed. Um, actually, I did want to mention something 
when we were talking about what's a good time saving tip, I wanted to share uh, something I've been guilty of that's a good way not to save time. Uh, and that's spending time on creating a script to do a solution and not saving a personal copy, like, you know, implementing it at clients and thinking, oh, I can always grab it from there. Uh, and then down the road when you want it, uh, you know, having to go through production networks to find that script. It's like, oh, yeah, I need to make, make sure I grab my own copy. Um, so that's a good way not to save time is not to keep your own. Uh, scripts that you've developed. Uh, another good thing on that same point is um, I've really been trying to focus on uh, not leaking out that sort of IP, right? So you're not saving a script to a client server. You're not putting that somewhere. Uh, you know, you're calling out to a repo or something like that. Or you're using lab tech to push that script, but then in your offboarding script, you're making sure you're deleting those directories and things like that. Um, because I feel like that that's just another value add that you're providing your customer. Um, so then if they are no longer you know, taking your services or whatever, when you remove your software or your monitoring and your management and stuff, uh, that is one of those features that they lose. Um, you know, that's something that you provided for them. Um, so, I like to do a lot of cleanup behind myself of making sure that I'm ripping off my own IP um, because I do the opposite to every uh, customer that I take over from another managed service provider. I try to go and snoop around in their environment and try to steal anything cool that I can uh, from the previous provider. And so, uh, a lot of times I try to clean all that sort of stuff up so that if there is a good provider coming in behind me, they can't kind of do the same thing. That's a, definitely a good point. Um, and uh, I, that can go along with anything. So if you're offboarding just a standard agent, not necessarily uh, a, a consulting setup, um, make sure to remove your LTSVC service and any uh, C folders that you uh, custom add to for your stuff. Um, uh, it, it's good to make sure you clean all that up when you're offboarding as well so that you don't leave any awesome PowerShell scripts or awesome EXEs behind. Um, yes, Chris uh, is a ninja. A uh, quick question for uh, Kyle, Tyler, and, and Chris. Um, are you familiar with active setup in a registry? The active setup key, what it does? Am I allowed to Google it? No. no. <laughs> Just do you know what it is? Uh, no, so, I have not. And so uh, I'm, I'm mentioning that because that's something that I learned about when we were taking over for a client and we uninstalled a bunch of their software and uh, we are migrating them. You know, it was, a, it was a transfer from a bigger company. So we cut off from their domain and we were migrating to a new domain controller. But when we would log in, we were finding that agents would take like 20 minutes or so to log in and trying to figure out what's going on um there you know we're looking at the machine startup scripts and all this stuff and i'm trying to figure out you know what is going on and that's how i learned about active setup registry keys uh which will you can use to trigger a command um when a new user logs in um and so what was happening is as we would log in, the, the previous IT company had it set up so that when you logged in, it would automatically, you know, run through configuration for uh, your office suite and, um, you know, would, would try to install some registry values and try to uh, install certain applications, do drive mapping. Uh, all these things that were resources on the old domain, so they were timing out. Um, but that, that was, uh, an interesting thing to, you know, come across and, you know, was something that's like, oh, wow, this is really cool, you know, to learn about that, uh, because someone else had done it and we followed along and, uh, got to see it. So, yeah, we don't want someone else following us and, uh, learning one of our cool tricks. <laughs> Happy uh -huh. to share in here. Uh, and, uh, maybe a little cool trick that's kind of like that um, that I like to use for kind of 
one-off type things uh, I use for a lot of friends and family that want their computer fixed or something like that is I have a lab tech location, uh, like a special location. And then all I do is have a user install an agent for that location. Once you're in that location, it runs a whole bunch of maintenance, cleanup scripts, malware type scripts, yada, 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 yada. And then once it's done, it just uninstalls LabTech off the machine. So it's kind of like a, you install this agent, it runs through a whole list of things, and then it uninstalls itself. Um, I found that that's uh, pretty use for, useful as well for um, all, all kinds of scenarios. And then sends an invoice? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's, got the, he's got the PowerShell APIs to connect wise for that. Um. That that's actually a uh, very few amazing tips. Um, I'm glad this is being recorded uh, for future posterity, and no reason outside of that to help other people. Um, Martin says PayPal has an API. Just saying, uh, in case anyone missed that. Um, but uh, uh, thanks, Darren, for that. Uh, you wouldn't happen to have a script you could uh, put me in the Skype chat that I may or may not be able to utilize in the future. Um, I'm sending you a link. I just pasted it into the uh, GeekCast channel, but I am okay. sending uh, you a link to kind of uh, okay. gather up these things. Yeah, that's for my eyes only. Um, well, the intention is that you're going to share this. <laughs> uh, maybe. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, but uh, so uh, we, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, we, we've done a lot of information. Uh, we went over a lot of concepts, uh, both core and to the MSP and core to lab tech and core to automate and all that good stuff. Um, yes, uh, Gavin, I'm all about that free IP. Um, <laughs> But uh, we, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, I think we, we, we've come a long way. Um, we've been streaming for about two and a half hours now. Um, and unless anyone has any questions, I think that we can begin to wrap it up unless, any, uh, unless you guys have any other points you want to make. If there's no questions, I'll throw a couple little things out. Um, uh, Using lab tech scripts to push PowerShell, you know, pushing that automation off onto the agent. We talked about that. Remote monitors are another uh, place where there's, you know, good opportunity for that. Instead of, you know, having the server try to do all the work, um, when you can have a remote monitor that can check for a condition and, you know, automatically do some additional checking and possibly even remediation. Um, you know, that's going to be a lot more efficient, quicker response, and you're pushing the load out onto all the other agents versus having the server get an alert and then create a ticket and fire a script and, and you know, do all this back and forth. Um, if you have a script that can check for a condition, it can, you know, automatically remediate, and when it's done, output a result, you know, uh, success or fail. Um, you know, you can do a lot of cool stuff with remote monitors. Uh, uh, on that point, uh, we can talk about event logs, uh, which are basically useless inside of lab tech from a <laughs> data gathering metric. Not many people understand that, uh, the way lab tech gathers the event logs and brings them inside of its database, um, uh, are 90% useless. Uh, you might get lucky and find one or two thing, uh, one, two things that are useful, but the it, it's hard coded at 300 events. Um, so if you've got a particularly event log noisy server, uh, it's just not gonna. It's it's just pointless. Um, and truncate that table as much as possible and use remote monitors to uh, check for event log events and IDs along those na along that nature um, or PowerShell if you're Chris Taylor. Uh, and PowerShell inside of remote monitors can be a little tricky. Um, there's a lot of times you have to do uh, kind of a dumb little workaround where you have to wrap it in a bat file or something like that. Uh, so you have to be kind of wary of things like that as well with remote monitors. Um, there is some stuff you can just put in raw PowerShell and it'll work fine. 
Uh, and there's other stuff that comes back with weird results. Um, but generally, wrapping it in a bat file seems to give good results. Several people are typing. Uh, I'll wait patiently to see if any of those are actual questions. Um, I think we're I think we're pretty much uh, no we're not gonna get oh my gosh uh, <laughs> no we're not gonna get shirts made um, for IT Nation. Uh, you said A N man. Oh sure. Automation we Nation. Time. Whatever. Unless yeah, there's time, man. I'll. Uh, uh, as long as ours have second class in our names, you know, yes. I'm good. Uh, second class title. I'm sure Gav will be thrilled. Um, that is uh, that is a massive remote monitor. Um, <laughs> it makes it worse that my Slack is like small, like it's not full screened, so it like removed all of my chat that I had up. Uh, so I I think. Uh, uh, we we like doing these, um, the at least the admins. Um, it's a pretty easy setup to to make these live streams and stuff. And it's it's a definitely a huge thank you to Chris and and Darren for both joining us today on very short notice. Um, and I'm I'm glad we could make it work out and go over some some big points and topics that not everyone gets to uh, uh, generally have asked. Um, and it, it, some questions and stuff that aren't necessarily. Uh, easily found a good spot in um so I, i'm glad this went as well as it did a big thank you to all you guys who are here all you guys watching um everyone who is a part of this community because everyone here is great we've all shared stuff we've all taken stuff um i don't think anyone aside from a few uh horrible individuals who have uh taken and not actually given something back to the community um so so thank everyone who's here um a couple of things. Uh, Tyler, do you want to go over the new form stuff, or you don't want me to do it? Oh, I can. Um, so, well, just to, to start off, to uh, just once again, thanks, uh, Darren and Chris. Uh, you know, it's phenomenal job. I, I think you've probably left some people scratching heads, especially with uh, your, your remote monitor there. But <laughs> um, So uh, I'm sure everybody's noticed by now we have the new form set up. Um, they are still slightly in progress. Uh, we do have uh, s things such as the downloads section uh, planned to, to come up. Uh, it's, um, I think we believe I believe we're starting to give access out a little. Um, just testing. Uh, we hope to have something that'll very easily benefit for script sharing as well as anything else that you guys may find useful. Whether it's you know tools that you may make, you know PowerShell. Uh, Bat batch files, any anything you know you guys deem worthy. Uh, it, it also allows you to get some feedback, whether it's ratings or, or just a, a dedicated place for that kind of stuff. Um, we're also moving the forms around, uh, organizing categories to, to kind of encompass some of the other um, management tools, such as you know more of ConnectWise Manage, uh, ConnectWise Cell, and Connect or Control rather. So uh, if, if you guys see any issues or have any suggestions in the meantime, of course, just let us know. Uh, I know there's been some some hiccups here and there with minor things, but I, I think for the most part, we're, we're headed in the right direction to give uh, a lot more back to you guys, whether it's more geek casts or just, you know, features to make the forms better, you know, better searching. I'm sure everybody's thrilled for that. But um, and of course, if you guys have any ideas for future casts, of course we're going to have the the report center eventually. Uh, as, as, as we said, poke Gavin, he'll it'll help speed him up. But uh, <laughs> uh, other than that, um, I, I'm sorry, I heard you say searching. Does that mean searching works now? No, I said it's, I was aware of it. Uh, the the issue that well, it's not working. Um, I have not had. I've been a little busy today, <laughs> uh, making sure that this so, actually was semi decent as far as running goes. I haven't fixed that problem yet. To um, clarify, the searching should be better once it works. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, everyone is through your entire spill about the forums. Everyone's been talking about Chris and standing up. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised no one's asked him to marry him yet uh, and try to get his PowerShell repository. Um, I mean that that's the angle you guys want to get. Intimidating man. That's all it uh, is. Uh, just... Marriage is against my religion. Sorry. Oh, bam. 
Look, shut down before you even get a chance. <laughs> shut down before there's even a shot. Uh, that that uh, <laughs> that's got to hurt at least someone. Um, but uh, yeah, the the new forums are up. Uh, a big thank you for uh, you know Tyler and all the other second class administrators helping get that set up and running. Um, uh, and thank all of you who have donated. Uh, we are still taking donations. Um, you know, if, if anyone feels the, the need to, you know, give back, uh, even more than they already have, uh, we, we're, we're planning to doing some stuff. Um, we haven't finalized any details yet. As soon as we get those, uh, good and ready, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you guys know. Um, but if there is any issues, uh, feel free to hit up someone, uh, in the administration section, I'm sure you all know us by now. Um, or you can just uh, let Gav know. Just him only. No one else needs to know. Um, and make sure to mention stuff about reports because still waiting on my report. The free one. I'm not going to pay for that. And uh, on that note, I think that's it, guys. Wow. Thank you very much. Thanks, Have a wonderful Have a evening. Thanks, oh, everyone, for coming. Try.